Before we begin, I know what you're thinking. A video on MLP FIM in 2020 and on a damn ship in it? Well, people still go after the fans in 2020. Yeah, we're still not past that even after it ended, but let me explain. Ever since the show ended, this particular ship has been on my mind for some time. There have been some things about it that I've gotten amped up about on Twitch. And for those of you who watch me on Twitch, which if you haven't, you should, yeah, you probably saw this coming. So, in an effort to understand why I like what I like, help myself, and possibly others, I thought I would take my thoughts and make a video with them. I'm going to go about this in the best way I can possible. Hopefully, not too many people jump down my throat for my opinion slash why I have that opinion. One different opinion equals all hell breaking loose at times. Hopefully, that won't be the case here. Though, fanboys, let's just worry about that when the time is right. Now on to the video. When it comes to the ship game for MLP FIM, I only followed it for a few years, sometime from 2013 to 2016. I felt I had enough and sat out for a bit. Everything was going fine. And then... A NEW CHALLENGER COMES! They showed up. The Student Six. Smolder the Dragon, Yona the Yak, Gallus the Griffin, Silverstream the Hippogriff, and the two that will be the talk of this video, Ocellus the Changeling, and the lone pony of the group, Sandbar. I didn't think much of the Student Six at first, but they grew on me over time. When it comes to shipping, it always felt like I had a soft spot for Ocellus x Sandbar but it was always kept in the deepest part of my mind. Then one day, the gears started turning, and sometime after Finn ended, I completely fell in love with this ship. Though, some people have tried to imply that it can't be canon. After thinking about it, I don't think that's completely the case. Now hold your horses for a minute, enjoy what you enjoy. What I'm saying, is that the one episode and one scene that tried to shoot the ship down is too vague enough to do just that. In this video, we'll break it down. Let's get into it. But before I begin, we need to take a look at the characters' personalities. This will help give us a better idea of the characters themselves, and will also help us understand why I feel this ship works. Let's start with Ocellus. Out of all the student six, it seems as if Ocellus was a counterpart for Fluttershy, given how she is portrayed as shy, someone who would prefer to blend into the background at times, and sometimes transforming into the creatures she is amongst. She evolves from this after spending time with her circle of friends. She's also the smartest of the bunch as well, though at times she feels ashamed of the dark past of the changelings before they saw the light, for lack of a better term, despite this not really being any of her fault. This past will come back into play later on. She also has an interest in meditation, as shown in Uprooted, and in cheerleading episode that shall not be named, she's shown to have trouble with public performances. So she's basically a mix of Twilight Sparkle and Fluttershy, though she evolves from the shyness. Smart, kind, calm, less shy as the series went on, willing to help her friends out, and cute would probably be the words to use when it comes to a Cellus. Moving on to Sambar, who somewhat described on Equestria Daily as having no personality, which I put that in air quotes. Well, time to take that down. Everyone else in the Student Six has quite the eccentric personality. You would think that would make them all stand out in their own ways, and it does. But Sambar stands out for a different reason. He's more or less the easygoing straight man, which counterbalances the others in terms of personality. He's also the most considerate and thoughtful among them, like when he gave Gallus a replacement quill during the School of Friendship song, defended Yona's admiration for her yak heritage, and even cutting class with his friends to keep them out of trouble. He also has quite the care for plants, and even gave us sapling earmuffs when he thought Gallus was disturbing it. Easy to get along with, always watching out for his friends and those he cares about, 
and chill are probably the best things said about Sambar. In a way, much like a Celis, I'd like to have a pair of friends like them in real life. Kind of like how I view it in my mind. Anyway, I think I gave a decent overview of the characters themselves. Now, with their personalities outlined, let's get into the ship. With Sambar's easygoing personality, to be honest, he could have worked with any of the other females of the Student Six. But out of all of them, I feel he works best with Acellus. Both have a sense of looking out for others amongst them, and if Acellus ever had something that was bothering her, I feel like Sambar would be the easiest to talk to about it because of how easygoing he is. Plus, even though some in a relationship with a changeling would want them to change into possible crushes, I wouldn't necessarily see Sambar using this because I'd feel he'd be able to love Acellus for herself, much like how he likes his other friends for themselves, but this would be in a more romantic sense. Not to mention, even despite the supposed past of the changelings that worry her, he would be able to assure her that they and everyone else around can move forward from it in the best way possible. Yeah, remember when I said I would bring that past back up? Well, here we go. This past and background lore gives the changelings a sense of uniqueness, probably the most unique species slash race in the entire show. From evil to good and beyond, it's quite a development. Not to mention, family introductions could be interesting, and for that matter, family interactions in general. Also, this ship could show overcoming adversity. Despite what they know, the past helps Sambar understand where Acellus was coming from with said fear of it. Possibly overcoming some form of PTSD when Sambar was young when the Changelings attacked in the Season 2 finale? Okay, maybe that didn't quite happen, but it's something to think about. If he were with Yona, all these interesting opportunities would go up in smoke faster than Night Dive's attempt to re-release the No One Lives Forever series. When I see the axe in MLP, I just see Vikings. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but I feel only just enough background lore was explored from what I saw. They really don't have as deep of a background as the Changelings, which makes things seem more standard than it probably should be. Because of this, there really isn't too much adversity to overcome. Well, as shown in that one episode that I will get into later, there isn't any adversity completely not there. But that was all that ever really came up. Nothing else further was mentioned, and there really wouldn't be too much to overcome if any adversity did come up later on. Which I don't think there really wasn't. At least, not that I can remember. So yeah, if he were with Yona, it wouldn't be very challenging. Him with Acellus leads to more challenges that lead to bigger payoffs. The harder they are, the sweeter the reward. I just want something outside of the norm at times, and not just take what's handed to me like some people would do. Actually, it's more than some given <sighs> that episode. Before I get into the takedown of that episode, I want to mention that all the comments mentioned here from Grounded Aviator and Gold D. Luffy come from Misanthropony's review of the episode that we'll be bringing up shortly. Map had a pretty good breakdown of the episode, and the others made some good points as well. Anyways, on to... <sighs> that episode. Yes, folks. I've been dreading this day for some time now. But I can't talk about this fiasco and not mention She's All Yak, the episode that has pretty much put us where we are now. While I don't have a burning hatred for this episode as much as I thought, hell if anything, it's just average. 6 out of 10 if you ask me. It's more or less the effect it had. Yonabar took off quite a bit after this aired. If that's your thing, good for you. Have a cookie. But for me, it's not really the be-all, end-all for shipping Sandbar like some make it out to be. The same goes for that one scene in the finale where the two work at Rarity's Boutique. That's what ultimately bothers me the most, mainly because, well for starters, like I mentioned earlier, the challenge is for Iona to eventually learn to be herself for lack of a better term. 
which already has been done time and time again on God knows how many shows, done with more uniqueness on said other shows, and it plays out exactly as you expect. Also, the episode seems less about the challenge, and more or less just wanting to pay tribute to She's All That, hence the name of the episode and how it plays out at times. Now, of course, the target audience for the show won't know what that film is, unlike the rest of us, at least I would assume so, but in a way, as the Grounded Aviator put it, it just feels like them being awkward 14-year-olds, his estimated age for them. And most of us are not that romantic then, unquote. I would probably use teens instead, but you get the idea. Some people would probably also mention the blushing as an indication, but refer back to the Grounded Aviator's quote. Blushing can be used for awkwardness after all, and not necessarily in a romantic sense. Not to mention, the challenges in the episode are not really followed up on at any other point, and to be honest, there might not be much reason to do so because of how it isn't very interesting, and it's not explicitly stated that the interactions between Yona and Sambar would become something more. At the end of it all, I'm left desiring something more interesting and risk-taking. Hell, Goldie Luffy had a decent suggestion saying it would have been better if Acellus was the one having the crush and disguising herself as a pony given... Well, you know. Now before we wrap up, there's one last thing I want to mention. The overall grand scheme. Does this episode affect the overall arc of the show? If I could strike this episode down, or if you took this out of the overall run, would anything major change? And the ultimate answer I would have to say is no. No major plots would be affected, and I feel things would be normal, but maybe I'd do a few things differently. Uh, but that's just me. Ultimately, the episode, and that scene in the series finale, I feel is too vague to confirm or deconfirm anything for that matter. You just have to believe what you feel, and that's how I feel. Well, it's finally done. Not gonna lie, this was more of a challenge than I expected, but I'm glad I got my thoughts out there. Hopefully, I can put this to rest and move forward. Though Season 10 comics might have me think otherwise, I choose to remain optimistic because of the ship and how much I love it. I mean, it's basically been a lifeline for me during this whole ordeal the world is going through right now, and even if the world wasn't so messed up at the moment, the ship would still be good for me. Actually, great. If I ever had a rough day or wasn't in a good mood, I could use a Sambar Exocellus picture, and it would bring me a sense of peace, happiness, and just about every positive emotion you can think of. So to everyone who's made any kind of art for this ship, be it pictures, fan fiction, or shown any kind of support on said art, or wherever, on Sambar Exocellus, I say thank you. It's because of people like you that show dedication to an underrated ship that encourage me to write my thoughts down, or type them down more appropriately, and make this video. Whew. Well, that was fun, but it's time to get back to what I usually talk about. Keep an eye out for my next review. See you all then. Thanks for watching. If you like what you saw, click the big red button below to subscribe. Check out the other links in the description for more cool stuff. And check out the playlist on screen for more content. See you in the next video.